Hello, I'm Graham Priest again, and uh, this is the fifth of a series of short lectures we're making on the relationship between Buddhism and science. In the last two lectures, we talked about God and we talked about the self. In the next two lectures, I want to change gear a little, and I want to talk about logic. Now, it may not have occurred to you that logic is a science. So perhaps I should start by explaining why I think it is. And then we're going to have a look at a little bit of Western logic. Uh, and then in the next talk, we'll look at uh, or contrast that with uh, some Buddhist logic. Okay, so let, let's start with logic itself. So what is logic? Logic is a study of um, certain Perhaps we can call them logic words that we use when we reason. So words like not, words like if, words like implies, words like must, we can call these logic words. And when we reason about things, we often use these words. It uh, doesn't really matter what we're reasoning about, these words always come in, like if or must. And logic is a study of how these concepts, these words, operate. Okay, so that's roughly what logic is. Now, uh, in the West, logic has been through two and a half thousand years of development. So uh, it's usually reckoned that there are three great periods of uh, the development of logic in uh, Western history of philosophy. The first one is in ancient Greece, when uh, Aristotle and the Stoics constructed the first theories of how these words work. The second great period in the theory of logic was in the medieval universities of Oxford and Paris uh, and similar places in Europe, uh, which are actually a very, very sophisticated period in the development of logic, although much of the sophistication was forgotten um, with the decline of scholasticism around the 16th century. But anyway, this was the second great period in the history of logic. The third great period in the history of logic in Europe starts around the end of the 19th century when uh, logicians such as the great German logician Gottlob Frege, uh, the British mathematician uh, Bertram Russell, and then mathematicians like uh, David Hilbert and Kurt Gödel uh, developed many of the standard techniques of contemporary logic. Now, what distinguishes the third great period is that the people who were engaged in logic at this time were mathematicians and uh, they deployed the techniques of mathematics in order to provide a mathematical analysis of uh, inference of the, word, the, the way these logical words function. Now, uh, if you give a mathematical analysis of something, I reckon that makes it scientific. I'm not suggesting that this is a necessary condition. Maybe you can have a science which doesn't use mathematics, although it may be rather difficult nowadays. But if you use the techniques of mathematics to analyze something, then I reckon this makes it scientific. And certainly modern logic is highly mathematical subject. And so this is why uh, I think that logic is a science. All right, so um, I want to talk a little bit about some logical principles. Um, obviously, in a lecture of this kind, we don't have time to do a great deal, but I want to talk about two principles which have played a very significant role in the history of Western logic. And these two principles are called the principle of excluded middle and the principle of non-contradiction. Let me explain what these are. So, Logic is concerned with reasoning. Reasoning is about claims we make. Claims are express, expressed by declarative statements, such as, I don't know, Edinburgh is in Scotland, the moon is made of green cheese, uh, Australia is the largest country in the world, things like that. All right. The principle of excluding middle says that if you take such a statement, then it's either true or false. There's no third case. The principle of non-contradiction says that those two cases can't overlap, so something can't be both true and false. So Scudin Middle says everything is either true or false, non-contradiction, and says and not both. So if you look at the 
little diagram on your screen you will see a picture and you will see a little square and it's divided into two halves. On one side there are T, that's the truths, and the other side are the false and they don't overlap and they exhaust everything. So the principles of excluded middle and non-contradiction say that everything is in exactly one of those zones, either the T zone or the F zone and not both. Okay. So that's a diagrammatic representation of these two principles. Now, something else you need to know to follow what's going to happen is uh, about negation. So negation is what logicians call um, the logical world, not, or it's not the case. So if you've got uh, some declarative sentence, such as the sun is shining, if you negate it, you get the sun is not shining. And you'll see a little square, a uh, little angle symbol on the screen. Uh, that's the way logicians write negation. So if A is the sentence, the sun is shining, not A, that's the A with the uh, little angle in front of it, is the sun is not shining. Or if B is John loves Mary, then not B is John doesn't love Mary. Okay. So how does negation work? Well, a very natural thought is that negation takes something that's true and turns into something false. And it takes something that's false and turns it into something true. So um, if uh, A is a statement that we're in Edinburgh, I'm currently in Edinburgh, which is true. If I negate it, I get that I'm not in Edinburgh, uh, which is false. And if I take something that's false, such as Australia is the biggest country in the world, then, and I get that, I get Australia isn't the biggest country in the world, and that's true. So negation is something that toggles between truth and falsity. And so um, you can hear the principle of excluded middle as saying either A or not A is true. And you can hear the principle of non-contradiction as saying and not both. Okay. So that's negation. All right, now let me talk a little bit about the history of those two principles. They're both endorsed by Aristotle, both excluding middle and non-contradiction, and he defends them both in one of his works, the Metaphysics, book Gamma. And since Aristotle's defense of those two principles, they have been high orthodoxy in Western logic. That doesn't mean that there aren't dissenters. Um, there are people in the history of Western logic who have dissented from each of these principles. Oddly enough, the first dissenter of the principle it's good in middle was Aristotle himself. So in another of Aristotle's texts, De Interpretatione, he's worried about contingent things that happen in the future. And his example is a sea battle tomorrow. So he's sitting at the Parthenon, he's looking out over the Aegean, there are two fleets there, there are the Spartans, there are the Athenians. Are they going to fight? Are they not going to fight? We don't know yet. The future is radically undetermined. And Aristotle says, well, these things in the future, statements there's going to be a sea battle tomorrow, are at the moment neither true nor false. Tomorrow, they'll be either true or false, but at the moment they're neither. The future is radically undetermined. Okay. So, oddly enough, he's the first person to question the principle excluded middle. Now, you might well ask how you square that with his defense of excluded middle in the metaphysics. Very good question. This is something that scholars of Aristotle argue about. And I'm not going to enter into that debate here. All I want to point out is that you might well think that future contingents are, uh, provide counterexamples to excluded middle. Finding people in the history of philosophy who've denied uh, the principle of non-contradiction is much harder, but the most obvious example is uh, Hegel. So Hegel does seem to endorse contradictions. He does this, for example, in his account of motion in uh, his, his logic. So he says this, um, what is it for something to be in motion? Hmm. Well, it's not to be here at one moment of time, and here at another moment of time, but to be both here and not here at the very same moment of time. 
Those are his words. Well, I, of course, he spoke in German. I'm translating, but those are essentially his words. So he think, Hegel thinks that motion actually realizes true contradictions. Now, uh, I have mentioned uh, Aristotle on future contingents and Hegel on motion, just to say that there are some dissenting voices in the history of Western philosophy. However, let me reiterate that these people are notable because they really are exceptions. So the principles of excluded middle and non-contradiction have been high orthodoxy in Western logic. Now, uh, in the next lecture, I want to talk about the situation in some parts of Buddhist logic. We'll see matters are somewhat different. But all I've tried to do in this lecture is uh, explain what the principles of uh, excluding middle and non-contradiction are uh, and what they mean and their orthodoxy in Western logic. So to remind you, Excluded middle says that every declarative statement is either true or false. Non-contradiction says, uh, and not both. In terms of negation, excluded middle says that A and not A must be in either the trues or the falses. And uh, non-contradiction says that A and not A can't be in the same zone, not in the trues and the falses. And uh, at least since the time of Aristotle, these two principles have been high orthodoxy. Now, what happens when we move to Buddhist logic, we'll see, but I'll address that issue next time. Thank you.